On this Boxed In, we're talking about how the COVID-19 pandemic has ravaged the Black community and spurred a mental health crisis, all of which can no longer be ignored. I'm Maureen Connolly, Editor-in-Chief of EverydayHealth.com and the host of Boxed In, COVID-19 and Your Mental Health. Joining me today is Everyday Health's Medical Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Patrice Harris, a psychiatrist and immediate past president of the American Medical Association. She's also visiting professor, Columbia University Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Harris has more than two decades of experience as a national health policy advocate, lecturer, and educator, and practicing clinician. She focuses her private practice on trauma and on child, adolescent, and adult psychiatry. Most recently, Dr. Harris was the first black woman to serve as president of the American Medical Association. One of Dr. Harris's initial efforts at Everyday Health will be to oversee black health facts and knowledge movement. Welcome, Dr. Harris. Hello, Maureen. Thank you so much. I'm so excited for our new partnership. <laughs> yeah, I am as well. So thank you so much for taking the time. Disparities in healthcare have been here all along, and, but this crisis has magnified them. We as a society, irrespective of race or ethnicity, can no longer ignore what's going on. And so my role as editor in chief at Everyday Health is to guide the editorial team on responsible and inclusive coverage for all of our readers and viewers. We are very much aware of the work that needs to be done so that this perspective is more evident across the board as it relates to our coverage. However, I must acknowledge that myself as a white American, I'm very conscious of the fact that I may not see all that needs to be addressed. And to that end, we at Everyday Health are very much looking forward to working with you over the next year to achieve this goal. So thank you. My pleasure. Uh, so the number of deaths from COVID among the black US population is disproportionately higher than any other race or ethnicity. According to the COVID tracking project, uh, which was started by The Atlantic and it tracks real-time data, they actually update it twice a week, Black Americans uh, are dying at 2.3 times the rate of white people. And doctors and public health officials uh, say that there are many factors contributing to this, but can you outline for us what these are and how all of these factors map back to one's mental health and well-being? Well, those numbers are startling, but I have to say they're not surprising uh, to uh, many who already were well aware of the disproportionate burden of illness in this country, looking at cancer and hypertension and diabetes. And certainly COVID-19 has brought into stark reality a lot of gaps in our health infrastructure in our country. Uh, but clearly issues around health inequities have been, again, brought into stark reality. And as we think about these inequities, we need to think about them as avoidable, meaning they don't have to be so. And we need to think about them in the context, of course, of social determinants of health, right? Access to transportation, affordable housing, employment, education, access to fresh fruits and vegetables. But I think it's critical for us to look even further upstream and to look at issues around structural racism and bias and discrimination. Yeah, so I guess uh, as a segue, I mean, would you say that racism is a public health crisis? And if so, can you explain what that means and I guess why everyone, regardless of their skin color, should, should care? And what can we do? Well, first of all, that's very important. Let's start there. And something you said in the beginning was the fact that everyone needs to know this information. I think sometimes there is a tendency to think that, of course you don't, and I'm sure present company excluded, uh, but there is a tendency to think that unless I share that lived experience, it doesn't impact me and I don't have to think about it. And I think it's that's one of the many reasons why it's so important to have these conversations and elevate them and have everyone realize uh, that they impact us all. And to that, and I wanna read, because I think that as we talk about racism and structural inequities and some of these issues, let's admit that sometimes the conversations can be complicated 
and hard and uncomfortable. So I always like to start any uncomfortable conversation uh, with a shared understanding and definition of what we're talking about. So a definition that I like of racism is from the American Public Health Association, if I may read it. Um, It says racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks, uh, which is what we call race. And of course, this system unfairly advantages some individuals and communities and unfairly disadvantages those same individuals and communities and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste. And so I really like that because, you know, it really talks about the system, but it also talks about how this system saps the strength of everyone. And I hope then that is a call to action for all of us to do what we can in our own backyard, both individually and systems we belong to and organizations we belong to, to address this issue. And that that is why uh, certainly racism is a public health crisis because it's a public health threat and a public health threat impacts us all. Yeah, and I, I feel like as outlined, you know, so many of the issues just, it almost seems insurmountable, right? It's like, where does one begin? Um, and the, the point that you made about, you know, the sort of, well, I've, or I heard like grassroots, you know, how would you advise um, people, where can they start, you know, within their community to make a difference? And, and I think it does start with, it, with each one of us. We can look at organizations that we belong to. Well, first of all, we can look at our own education and what we know and understand about health and health inequities and bias and racism, and really read and learn. Uh, there, there are books out there uh, that, that I think are, are wonderful books. And I do think everyone should commit to coming to the table informed and educated. So that's where people can start. They can start with themselves and then they can maybe widen that circle talk to a couple of folks who maybe don't look like you or believe like you or live where you live and develop a relationship where there is trust there. There's trust to make mistakes. A couple of my colleagues said, oh, I'm worried about saying the wrong thing or doing the right thing, but they are doing the wrong thing, but they know they can come to me and ask me questions. And if they make a mistake or say the wrong thing, I will uh, correct that mistake and educate them about where they need to go uh, to learn more uh, if they are interested. Uh, And then you move sort of further and further out in those circles. If you are uh, seated around decision-making tables, look at who else is around those decision-making tables. And if there's not a diversity of thought and opinion and gender and race and ethnicity around those tables, then raise your hand and ask the question why. And by the way, um, well, ask the question, what can we do about it? Why might be a part of that assessment? And by the way, the data is clear. You can look at any business data. I was just reading another updated study from the Harvard Business Review uh, that says organizations perform better. They are stronger organizations uh, when they are strengthened by diversity. And inclusion and equity, by the way. I, I do hope that as we are having these conversations, that we are making sure that we are not, that the end point is not numbers, right? This is not two women and uh, five, uh, you know, black folks and, you know, three Latinx folks. It's, it's beyond that because let's just say there's no one of color around a table that doesn't mean there can't be conversations around equity and inclusion and a starting point. You know, obviously if there's no one around the table, there's work to do, but there are still things everyone can do. Yeah. I love that. And speaking of work to do, so within the healthcare system itself uh, and the responsibility that, you know, physicians um, kind of need to uphold when it comes to recognizing these issues and then taking steps to change it and do something about it. As a public health advocate, is there going to be progress? 
Sure. But there is work. And, and, and of course, as you noted earlier, I am immediate past president of the American Medical Association, and I'm very uh, proud of our leadership on this issue and our journey and our evolution. The audience may not know, but decades ago, Black physicians could not join the AMA. And in 2009, our then immediate past president, uh, Dr. Ronald Davis, who unfortunately has passed away, offered an apology. And so that's a public acknowledgement of past harm, mm. right? a recognition. And so that's where organizations can start. And then it's, what do you do next? And so we are, or we did, uh, develop the Center for Health Equity at the AMA. And we are partnering and we are looking within, you know, there's a theme there. And we are looking first at our own organization internally and then looking at ways to partner externally. So I think that's a model for every organization. Look internally, look at policies and procedures. Again, who's around uh, decision-making uh, tables? What do we need to do to understand our own biases? What do we need to do then to partner externally with the community to understand what's going on in the community and how uh, some of these issues have impacted uh, communities? And partner and be an equal partner or bring those communities in as an equal partner um, to solve problems. You know, I love that how solution-based you are. You know what I mean? It's like, let's just try and be uh, also practical and realistic, you know, but solution oriented. Um, but at the same time, you know, what would, what worries you the most about what you're seeing unfold as it relates to COVID-19? Well, I'm worried that we won't take the time to learn the lessons that we should learn. Now, again, many of these uh, lessons should have been learned pre pre-COVID. Uh, but certainly right now, COVID has forced, in a way, attention on issues that people didn't have to see before because there were a lot of distractions. And during this period, there have not been a lot of other dis distractions, especially, you know, April to October or so, mm -hmm. September or so. So I think we should be intentional about learning the lessons because we have a tendency um, to, once we get through the acute phase of the crisis, we're like, we got through it. Okay, let's just figure it, you know, and, and we don't take the time or, or we're not as intentional as we need to be about the lessons learned. So to kind of close this out here, um, and I know this is sort of a big question, but I guess if you had to summarize what your overall mission is as a physician, what would you say? Physicians have a front row seat with our interactions with our patients to see the impact on all of the determinants of health, all the environmental issues that are swirling. And so what I believe is such a privilege of being a physician is that I have the opportunity and my mission is I have the opportunity uh, to first of all, learn from my patients and that make things better for that N of one that's in my office uh, but also use that data and use the power and privilege that I have as a physician to make things better, to advocate for uh, the entire community. That's great. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Thank you for you for being here. Uh, and thank you viewers for watching. If you want more information, you can go to everydayhealth.com. For more information and tips on navigating your health and well-being during the COVID-19 pandemic, go to everydayhealth.com slash tippy.